Ladies and gentlemen, looking into the future on how the state might evolve in the third millennium, we cannot ignore our past. Human history is to a large extent the history of wars, persecutions and destruction. In the 20th century, a high point was reached with millions of people killed in two world wars, in civil wars and in concentration camps all over the world. One cannot completely exclude the possibility that by the end of this century, technologies might be available which could destroy all human life here on planet Earth. Globalization, science and technology fortunately cause not only problems, but also offer humanity a huge opportunity to solve its problems. The challenge for the third millennium will be to develop and to implement a state model which fulfills the following conditions. First, a state model which prevents wars between states as well as civil wars. Second, a state model which serves not only a privileged section of the population, but which serves the whole population inside the state. Third, a state model which offers the people a maximum of democracy and the rule of law. And fourth, a state model which is geared to the competition of the age of globalization. Those goals can only be reached if the state is seen as an organization which has to serve the people and not the other way around. The state has to become a service company which competes peacefully and not a monopoly which gives the customer only the alternative either to accept a bad service at the highest price or to emigrate. For the large majority of the people, emigration is hardly possible because the possibilities for immigration have been drastically reduced. The alternative for many desperate and hopeless people is not emigration, but violence, terrorism, revolution and civil war. Even in democratic constitutional states, there are again and again minorities who rightly or wrongly feel themselves disadvantaged. One need only think of Northern Ireland, the Basque Country, South Tyrol, Quebec or the Aboriginal population of Australia, North and South America. As a young man, I was very impressed how Switzerland had solved a minority problem in the canton of Bern. The canton of Bern is not only one of the largest and most important cantons of Switzerland, but Bern is also the capital of Switzerland. In the Jura region of the canton, the French-speaking Catholics felt politically and economically disadvantaged compared to the German-speaking Protestant majority of Bern. The French-speaking population aspired to great autonomy for the Jura region, but they met with resistance from the German-speaking majority. The conflict escalated, there were bomb attacks, and radical elements wanted Jura to become part of France. The confederal Swiss government intervened in the internal cantonal problem and mediated a solution in 1974. The French-speaking regions of the canton of Bern voted for Jura to become its own canton. The decision was supported by a clear majority, although some French communities chose to remain in the canton of Bern. Over the years, the political and economic developments in Jura exceeded expectations and several French-speaking communities that had remained with Bern decided to join the canton of Jura. This peaceful and democratic solution after such violent conflict 
was for me an impressive example of a successful experiment in self-determination at the local level. A state model which is to secure peace, the rule of law, democracy and the welfare of the population has to withdraw from the state the monopoly of its territory. The emigration of the population is only a realistic alternative in our world if the affected population can emigrate with their territory. In order to realize it, the political units with the right of self-determination have to be very small. I was able to introduce the right of self-determination on a local level in the Liechtenstein constitution through a popular vote. Each of our 11 communities in Liechtenstein has the right to renounce its membership in the principality and become an independent state or join another state if the majority of the population in the community decides so. The smaller the unit, the smaller the probability that the affected population will decide lightly to emigrate. For the Principality of Liechtenstein, the conditions have been very favorable. But even here, some people doubted in the past whether it made any sense to remain a sovereign state and to keep the right of self-determination for its population. <coughs> for very small units, it is difficult to create a democratic state with the rule of law which works and which offers the population a higher welfare than the old state when the old state worked reasonably well. Nevertheless, the pressure for political reforms on a state which works badly increases dramatically. Otherwise, the state falls apart. The larger the political units with the right of self-determination, whether they are called provinces, federal states or cantons, the greater the danger that they will leave the state. The greater also is the danger that inside the new states there will be minorities who are discriminated against and who will one day defend themselves wildly. The breakup of Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union, the colonial empires, or also the Austro-Hungarian Empire clearly shows the problems when those units are too large. The smallest political unit in most states, which are more or less defined politically and territorially, are the local communities like villages and cities. In the past, local communities were sometimes divided, like the city of Berlin. But it is questionable if that makes much sense. There is much to be said for treating local communities as political units which should not be divided territorially any further. A community can consist of a village with a few hundred inhabitants and a few square kilometers or of a large city with several million inhabitants and several thousand square kilometers. In a local community, disadvantaged minorities can also emerge. If the majority of the population votes to withdraw from the existing state, usually such minorities are better integrated in their community and emigration to a neighboring uh, community is easier. In a small community, it will always be very difficult to convince a majority of the population that the withdrawal from the existing state is the right solution. Let's take a glimpse into a distant future when the states of this world have become service companies which are in peaceful competition for their potential customers. There the customer is king and can choose. Just as he can choose today if he wants to buy his hamburger at McDonald's or Burger King or fry it himself 
or what airlines he wants to fly with, or if he prefers to travel by car. In such a world, the state will not waste taxpayers' money on defense anymore, as it is already the case for a number of small states where an army means not additional security, but additional expenses. What are the duties left to the state in the third millennium, which cannot be solved better and cheaper by private enterprise or by the communities themselves? In my opinion, only foreign policy, law and order, education and state finances remain with the state. All the other duties can be fulfilled better and cheaper on the level of the communities or by private enterprise. I will not deal with foreign policy, as this matter will probably also in the future be very different from state to state because of geography, history and other reasons. For the vast majority of the population, the most important task of the state is to give them the legal protection or law and order. For having law and order and legal protection, most people are willing to pay a high price, either financially or by giving up some of their freedom and political rights. When anarchy looms, the call for the strong man or the dictator follows, who is then supposed to rule with an iron fist. Whoever wants to have democracy and the rule of law will see that the maintenance of law and order is by far the most important task of a state long before all the other tasks which have been taken over by the state today. In order for the democratic constitution state to function, the following institutions have to cooperate. The police, the public prosecution, the courts and the legislature. In my remarks, I will restrict myself to the legislature as he has the main responsibility whether the democratic constitutional state will maintain law and order or not. The requirement for the legislator to write in a short and understandable way should not only apply to the constitution but also to all laws and regulations which the normal citizen has to face in the course of his life. If on the one hand the state expects the citizen to know the constitution and the laws, it is the duty of the state, on the other hand, to inform the citizen as well as possible about the constitution and the laws which are in force. Nowadays, children in school have to learn many different things where opinions may differ about their use. Should it not be the task of the state to ensure that during compulsory schooling, these schools should also teach law? Should not the state give each citizen a compendium of laws which contains the constitution and the most important laws together with a commentary so that the citizen can find his way in the constitutional state and know about his rights and duties? Of course, there are a large number of laws and regulations which the citizen does not have to know in his normal life, but which are nevertheless necessary, for instance, to protect the, the consumer and the environment against products which are harmful. These regulations are aimed at companies of the industrial, the agricultural and the service sector. A large number of regulations is a burden especially for small companies. At the same time, those small companies are extremely important for employment and innovation in a national economy. Besides high taxation, 
complicated tax and social laws as well as regulations which change all the time are an important reason why small companies are not set up in the first place or fail soon afterwards. Since the public authorities at the state or community level receive from the companies direct and indirect taxes, duties, social service contributions, etc., it should be the legal duty of these authorities to advise the companies on those matters more or less free of charge. If the regulations are contradictory, those regulations have to be applied which are in favor of the taxpayer and the companies. If the state issues tax laws which are unclear or contradictory, the state should be liable and not the taxpayer. As important the parliament and the representative for indirect democracy are, even more important in my opinion for the democratic constitutional state will be direct democracy in this third millennium. Politicians and parties are often quite skeptical towards direct democracy, which is not surprising if one takes into account that it reduces their power. This is perhaps the reason why direct democracy, with the exception of Switzerland and Liechtenstein, is only possible in a very limited form, if at all. If one compares the decisions taken by the parliaments in Switzerland and Liechtenstein with the decisions taken by the people on the same subject soon afterwards, there can be a substantial difference. I just want to mention one example from Liechtenstein. In 1990, government and parliament decided unanimously to introduce a new tax law. The new tax law was rather complicated, but it reduced taxation for about 80% of the population. 10% would pay about the same amount, and the 10% richest people would pay higher taxes. The party thought that it would be a very popular proposition. The people in Liechtenstein collected enough signatures to put the new tax law to a popular vote, where it was rejected by about 80% of the voters because they thought it would reduce the competitive advantage of the Liechtenstein economy, an argument which I shared. The main arguments against direct democracy have been that people might vote for a law which discriminates against minorities or is not in the long-term interest of the people. In Liechtenstein, the reigning prince has a veto power, which he can use against such laws or changes of the constitution, with the exception if the majority of the voters decides to abolish the monarchy. The same veto power can be given to an elected president as long as there is a mechanism to remove him from office. In all indirect or representative democracies, the people's democratic rights are restricted to personnel decisions. Candidates from various political parties are usually elected as the people's representatives into local, regional or national offices. Any executive who has to make personal and commercial decisions for a company knows that personnel decisions are usually more difficult than commercial decisions, Parti particularly when an unknown candidate from outside is recruited for a management position. The effects of a commercial decision like opening or closing a factory or increasing or lowering a price can be calculated and evaluated more easily than the chances of success for a new member of the management. 
in a company at least, there is the possibility to have personal conversations with the candidates, as well as to, to apply other selection methods. Such options usually do not exist for voters. It may be argued that voters are now choosing a person they do not know, but rather a political program to which the candidate is committed. Today's political programs, however, are often undistinguishable and seem more like car advertisements. A car buyer, however, has the legal right to sue the car company if the technical claims in a car advertisement are not fulfilled. The disappointed voter, on the other hand, has no other choice but to wait a few years and then to vote for another party. This limitation of democratic principles made perhaps sense when large parts of the population had little education and illiteracy was widespread. Today it is much more difficult to justify. Firstly, there is little difference in the level of education between the rulers and the ruled. Even where there are great differences in the level of education in the population, for instance in a number of African states, one does not gain the impression that the most literate and educated people are in the ruling position. Secondly, the whole population has to bear the consequences of bad decisions at the highest level. Another important state duty which remains with the state is, in my opinion, the education system. If one takes into account that the modern economy and the modern state cannot be run by illiterate people, state authorities have to concern themselves with the education of their population. In our modern world, an illiterate person is very much handicapped. And for such a person, it is nearly impossible to find a well-paid job. Nevertheless, one can well ask the question whether it is one of the main responsibilities of the state to run the whole education system in the future. There are good reasons either to privatize the whole educational system or to delegate it to the local communities. To manage and to own the educational system from kindergarten to university will be the task of private business, local communities, associations of local communities or a joint venture between private business and individual local communities. The financing of the education system should be done through a voucher system with the children or the parents of the children as beneficiaries. The philosophy behind an educational system financed through vouchers is the following. The public authorities, be they the central or local government, finance today the whole educational system through direct subsidies from kindergarten to university. Instead of using the taxpayers' money to finance the education system, it is much better to subsidize the parents or the students so that they can themselves choose the school which, in their opinion, is the best for them. Well-managed schools, which are able to meet the expectations of the parents and the students, will be successful, and the others will have to adapt or they will disappear from the market. In order to prevent abuse by parents and schools, the subsidies for the parents and the students should not be paid out in cash, but rather in vouchers which are redeemed in those schools which fulfill a minimum standard. Parents should only be allowed to cash in those vouchers if they make a commitment towards the state that they will educate their children themselves or privately. 
already today in a number of states, a number of states release their children, the, the children from compulsory school attendance, if it can be proven that the children will receive an education equal to that provided in a publicly maintained school. Schools like other institutions managed and owned by the public authorities tend to become bureaucratic and inefficient sooner or later. Politicians are reluctant to dismiss headmasters or teachers who are no longer able to fulfill their task. In many cases, a dismissal is very difficult and according to the law in a number of states only possible after long and public court proceedings. Politically influential teachers' unions are a further obstacle to an efficient school system because the welfare of the teachers is in their eyes, of course, more important than the welfare of the students. The political resistance against voucher systems is usually organized by those powerful teachers' unions. The fact that parents and students are willing to pay substantial amounts of money to finance education in private schools and universities, which are usually much more expensive than the public educational system, shows that in many cases the public educational system from kindergarten to university do not meet the expectations of parents and children. Nevertheless, despite their financial sacrifices, the state forces those people to finance with their tax an inefficient school system which they do not want to use. But only rich parents can afford that. The state should and will continue to play an important role in a voucher system, but a role which will support social justice in society and not hinder it in contrast to the educational system of today. The legal framework set by the state through law or decree will have to clarify a number of questions like the minimum value of a voucher, how long parents or students are legally entitled to a voucher, what are the minimum standards for schools which may redeem vouchers, as well as a number of other questions. A state whose tasks are basically reduced to the maintenance of the rule of law, foreign policy and the financing of the education system will have to reconsider fundamentally public finances. At the level of the communities or associations of communities, new tasks have to be dealt with, which have to be carried out and financed mainly locally. There is much to be said for leaving indirect taxation to the state with the local communities obtaining authority for all direct taxation. Compared to direct taxation, it is much easier to raise indirect taxes. Much can be automated and the state needs only a few civil servants for this task. A centralized administration for indirect taxation would be the most practical solution even if the tax authority would lie with the local communities. For this reason, the authority to raise indirect taxes should lie with the state and the authority to raise direct taxes with the local communities. There have been a number of publications and discussions about the rate of indirect taxation, as for instance the value-added tax. More important than the level of the tax rate seems to be that the rate should be uniform. Nevertheless, politicians love to choose different levels of tax rates with the surprising justification that this is socially fairer. The highest tax rate is applied to luxury goods or what politicians decree as being luxury goods, whilst lower tax rates are applied to other goods and services down to total exemption from indirect taxation. 
This turns the rather simple system of indirect taxation into a complicated system which needs additional civil servants. This, of course, gives the politicians the possibility of employing their friends and fellow party members as civil servants. In addition, it gives politicians and parties unlimited possibilities to buy votes not by handing out taxpayers' money, but rather through tax advantages. The influence of the state on the economy, and with it the influence of the politicians, is increased because the politician can now put this product or that service into this or that bracket. Because the consumer lower taxation rates on certain products and services are usually much more in favor of the rich people than in favor of the poor people. The poor people, from time to time, also consume products or services which politicians have defined for unknown reasons as luxury goods. It costs the state and the taxpayer a significant amount of money without helping the poor people in society if the politicians pursue a social policy with different tax rates in indirect taxation. Anyone who wants to help the poor people in a society must <coughs> help them directly. If the authority for direct taxation lies with the local communities and for indirect taxation with the state, there are good social, political and economic reasons not only for a uniform tax rate, but also for a rather high tax rate. Indirect taxation will then be the only instrument for a limited redistribution of income within a state between richer and poorer regions. A state whose responsibility is restricted only to foreign policy, the financing of the education system, and the maintenance of the constitutional state needs less tax revenues. With high revenues from indirect taxation, the state should be in a position to achieve substantial surpluses. Part of the surpluses will be needed to service the national debt and to repay it over a certain period of time. The state should also sell all state property which is not needed for its main tasks anymore, in order to pay back the national debt as quickly as possible. The aim is a state without debts, so that the surpluses from indirect taxation can be distributed fully to the local communities according to the number of their inhabitants. This allocation per capita of the surplus revenues from indirect taxation should give the local communities the possibility of covering at least a part of their expenses. The rest has to be covered by direct taxation or other income. Such a division of the tax authority would have the major advantage that the local communities and the whole population within the state would have a very strong interest in the state behaving as economically as possible and not putting itself more into debt. Only then would the local communities and their population benefit from surpluses of indirect taxation. On the level of the local communities and with direct democracy, the population has a much better control over the use of the taxpayers' money than it does at state level. To prevent the state from financing its tasks through debt, it is important to introduce an article into the Constitution which makes it very difficult for the state to raise any loans. What has been achieved by the state of Liechtenstein, originally a very poor state without natural resources, but now without debts, should also be possible with a solid fiscal policy for other developed states. Neither should the state of the future 
give any guarantees to the local communities, communities and associations of communities. Only if a community can go bankrupt and its existence be threatened, will the large majority of the voters support a long-term solid fiscal policy at the community level. The danger of bankruptcy will also force creditors to follow a prudent and responsible loan policy towards the communities. Up to now, in a number of states, companies and banks have sold exaggerated projects and loans to respected but inexperienced counselors, knowing that in the last resort the state will have to pay. A state without debt, with foreign policy, the financing of the education system and the maintenance of the constitutional state as its only duties will become again a lean and transparent state which can be financed by a small percentage of the gross domestic product. The surplus from the revenues of indirect taxation would flow directly to the local communities, which would have in addition the authority for direct taxation. Those would be taxes on companies and individuals, real estate, dogs, cats or whatever, a local politician can think of. In principle, a community could have the possibility of raising in addition to the state an indirect tax on certain products or services. To reduce consumption for health reasons, a community might put an additional tax on alcohol or tobacco. The financial subsidies of the state from indirect taxation and the tax authority over direct taxation should enable communities with even limited resources to finance at least a basic welfare system. It should be possible to reduce the financial burden of the pension system by increasing, by raising the retirement age and by encouraging the increase of private pension systems. Nevertheless, this is very much dependent on the employment of the population and economic development. Such a fundamental reorganization of the state should ease the financial burden on private business, give a new impetus to private consumption, accelerate the growth of the economy and therefore increase the demand for additional labor. This would especially be the case for those local communities which structure direct taxation and social programs in such a way that it will be again attractive for people to work and for companies to employ additional labor. The fear that the race to the bottom for the lowest tax rate will start between the different communities is unfounded. The example of Switzerland and Liechtenstein shows that different tax rates between communities lead only to a limited migration of companies and people from communities with higher tax rates to communities with lower tax rates. For people and companies, tax rates are just one of many reasons why people and companies settle where they do. For companies, other reasons are more important, like the availability of a workforce, a well-developed infrastructure, or the proximity to markets. For most people, the tax rate is usually not a decisive reason for choosing where to live. Other reasons are more important, like the proximity of the workplace or good schools for the children. A community with High taxation and bad service will nevertheless lose people and companies in the longer term. The state of the future will give the people in their community much more freedom on how they want to shape the future for themselves and their descendants. 
There will be communities which will require higher taxation, but will offer a better service. Some communities might shape their service according to the needs of the elderly people and others for the requirements of young families. Through taxation, social programs, school and transportation systems, cultural programs, building regulations and the availability of building sites, etc., the communities in the state of the future will have considerable freedom to look for the best solutions according to the wishes of their population and the possibilities of their geographical area. In a direct democracy, the citizens in a community will decide how attractive his or her community should be for people and companies. You might ask yourself why a monarch can be inspired by a state model based on democracy. I realized quite early that nowadays a religious legitimation is not sufficient for a monarchy if the monarchy is supposed to fulfill a political function. Of course, it is not that easy to create a democratic legitimation for a hereditary monarchy, as it is in its nature, that the monarch is not elected. For this reason, I worked out a model for the Liechtenstein constitution where the monarch does not have an active legitimation through elections, which take place every few years, but rather through a passive democratic legitimation. That means that the monarch and the monarchy need the support of a majority of the population to fulfill his or its duties. We have therefore an article in the Liechtenstein constitution which gives the voters the possibility either to withdraw their confidence in the monarch or to abolish the monarchy with a simple majority. The study of history reveals that states have life cycles just like the individual humans who created them. They come and they go, they are born, they grow, their frontiers change, they decay and dissolve again. This is a natural process which people should contemplate in a more relaxed way and be prepared to shape peacefully. Hardly any state existed inside its present borders 200 years ago. The coming and going, the growth and decay of states have unfortunately rarely been peaceful processes. Revolution, civil wars and wars of conquest accompanied both the birth of states and their disappearance. I doubt whether we can afford this luxury in the third millennium. As worldwide knowledge of nuclear, bacteriological and chemical weapons has grown during the last 50 years, so the cost of producing those weapons have fall, has fallen. In deciding the life cycle of a state or disputes of territory, the weapon in the hand on the battlefield should be replaced with the ballot in the hand at the ballot, at the ballot box according to the rule of law in a democratic state. Thank you for attention. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And as usual, uh, we'll start off. I will ask a few questions myself before opening it up to the floor. Um, <coughs> so please, please do get thinking. Um, just following on from what you just said there about the uh, legitimacy of the monarchy is a passive democratic yeah. um, situation. Um, why does leaving legislative power with the monarchy work in Liechtenstein, whereas in most other countries around the world, including this one, um, the monarchy and the legislative power with the monarchy was rebelled against? Uh, how, do you mean how it works? Well, I mean, why does it work? Or why does it work? <coughs> well, uh, because the people like it like this. We have, of course, a <laughs> we have, of course, we have a parliament, we have parties. Uh, 
Much of the legislative work is done, of course, in, in the government or uh, with the specialist or, or yeah, in, the, in the different departments of the uh, government. Um, but then it is like this that um, uh, the draft, uh, and that, that is now the, the, the work which goes directly to, uh, to which goes to, to parliament, where the parliament is the, f the, the one of the decisions. The, there, uh, it is then discussed by the chief of government with the reigning prince. Or now, uh, it's it, it's my son, my eldest son. I have retired there. I'm still nominally the, the, the reigning prince, but he is uh, the one who took over. And uh, there, it is discussed. The drafts. Uh, one goes through it, discusses it, um, see if there are weaknesses. Uh, we have also at our disposal then. Uh, experts from our side, uh, so there's a certain check there, uh, and then uh, it goes uh, usually then into the parliament, and uh, yes, and then if parliament accepts it, uh, it is finally signed by the reigning prince. But the reigning prince has the last say; he can refuse to sign it. He has a veto power. Uh, that's, let's say, the normal way how you how it is done, uh, like in other states to a certain degree. Well, you you might have not a, a monarch, but you might have a president or whatever. It's a little bit like in the U.S. where it's also discussed with the president and he has a veto power. Uh, now you have then another process which is possible with direct democracy, where. Uh, people uh, think that one want they want to have a, a, a new a change the law or a new law change the constitution uh, so they work out locally a small group very often uh, a draft and then they go to collect enough signatures um, which is not that much of course we are a small country but with us for for new law a thousand signatures, which are had to be certified, are sufficient uh, to put it basically to a vote. And for a change of the constitution, uh, it's 1,500 signatures. So it's not a big hurdle. And therefore, we have quite a number of votes. Mm -hmm. uh, then it, what happens, so if, if there is a, uh, if, if this draft is then things, then it's checked if there's enough signatures. Uh, then there are again two possibilities. One possibility is that Parliament says, "Oh, that's great! Yeah, we are going to accept that," or they say, "No, no, we are not want to have that." Uh, and then, uh, within a certain time limit, there has to be a popular vote. But then again, the reigning prince has to sign it off. He is also against a decision by the people. Uh, he, he can put the veto which my father did, I, uh, he, when he did, he didn't say anything before the popular vote and afterwards he was criticized uh, that he should have said it before. Uh, then it might not have been gone through. So what I did, I, when I, there was something, or even if the government would, you know, you have, a, you have a quite a lively political uh, scene in Liechtenstein with different parties and so on. So uh, then I say beforehand, I say, uh, that's stupid. I'm not going to sign that. Uh, <laughs> in, those, in those exact words, or do you uh, make it a bit more <laughs> political? Yeah, then I say, OK. Well, then we sit together. Then they come, and they know it's not. In the beginning, they thought, oh, we are going to, uh, uh, to win the vote despite that. But up to now, Whenever I say it, uh, it's it's not a good law or, or so or change of it was always rejected in the popular vote. So now they know that they have to go before now to my son, to my eldest son, and to check if if if, if one is happy with it and and, and and we have no. It, it, very often there are sort of technical things which are badly drafted, uh, it goes counter, the law might go against the constitution, it might go against some international 
um, uh, treaties which they've signed. Uh, and, and, and so there's a certain check there. Thank you. I'm, I'm conscious of time, so we will open up to the floor straight away. So we'll go to the uh, uh, member on the inside here. Uh, hello, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Uh, my name is Aika, I'm a student here uh, at business school and I'm from Kazakhstan. Uh, you talked about the democracy and merits of it in, uh, in your country, in Liechtenstein, in Switzerland, but there are so many countries in the world where democracy isn't working. So my question to you would be, do you think, do you believe that democracy is uh, the best or a better regime for a society? Yes, I think so. I'm, um, I, I looked at many different state models because I was always interested in history and how has democracy evolved and how do you adapt it to larger states and so on. Um, I think the danger if you don't have a democracy, uh, you don't have uh, d d a check on the other side somehow. The rulers, even if they are full of good intentions, uh, they, they, they don't know what the people think, so, so they might go in a completely different direction. And so that, I think, is always good to somehow to be brought down uh, uh, on the soil again. You know, you, you might have all kind of ideas, etc., wonderful ideas, but the people say, well, he is crazy there up at the castle. You know? Uh, and then you <laughs> have to, uh, you're, you're brought back to reality. And I think that forces you also, I see it myself, when I wanted to, to get anything through, uh, I had to go through the people out in the villages and to discuss it with the people. Otherwise, I would not have been able to make those changes in foreign policy and domestic policy. So I think, uh, uh, I saw it as a big adventure. It's your market. You have to listen to the market, like in a company, you know, uh, market research. <laughs> and that's a little bit what it is, democracy, I think. And therefore, uh, of course, it's, it, it's not easy to build it up. And I think you have to build up from the, from the bottom up, first on the local th thing, or locally. And that was also our advantage. We had local democracy, and then we were able to build it up to the state level in the 19th century and then in 20th century again, again with reforms. But I think to have it locally, uh, on the village level, that helps because there the people have a better understanding. But you, I think from the bottom up, I think you have to build it. And that was, I think, one of the mistakes uh, done in um, uh, decolonization. They took models uh, centralized <coughs> models uh, and uh, copied those constitutions uh, and, 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 and everything quite centralized. It would have been better to, 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 to build on, on sometimes existing democratic uh, structures on the village level in many of those countries, in Africa, Asia, even Latin America. You had a local I think the people would discuss it. And so that, I think, would have been the more successful approach. You just spoke then about the similarity between, well, what you were just explaining, the similarity between running a business and running a country. Um, <laughs> did you find the two experiences to be very similar, or did you find them to be very different, and how so? Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's it, yeah, it's, uh, uh, to be very honest, I enjoyed much more the business side. <laughs> 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 because, you know, uh, you, you, you make your plans, you have your team, and then you say, okay, we take the decision, we try it out, you make quick decisions, you can uh, change it if it doesn't work. In politics, it <laughs> takes years and years, <laughs> and you have to convince so many people, and it's it's uh, yeah, it's 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 tiresome. Well, now I see the reason for the princely veto. So there, there you go. <laughs> um, look for another question from the floor, please. Um, yes, if we could go uh, to the member on the corner there, who just put the hand down. Yeah. 
Uh, yes, Your Serene Highness, um, I think you've presented tonight um, what I think is your ideal of a government, which is very small, very localized. Um, if I might ask you, if you look at the future of Europe, do you think Europe in the foreseeable future will be shaped like that? And if so, why or why not do you think such governments will shape the future of Europe? I think because to change the European Union uh, will be extremely difficult. Uh, it, it has been set up, uh, we discussed it before in a small circle, it has been set up to, to make Europe the United States of Europe. Um, and uh, that project basically failed in my opinion. We are not going to build that anymore. Uh, now, uh, the question is, could you, uh, what, no, one would have to, to, to come with a new model. I think uh, perhaps a model like, like a proposal a little bit to, to bring it much more down to the people on the local level just to, to be sure what do we really want to have uh, decided in Brussels by a parliament which should not be too big. I think uh, anyhow with so many millions of people nobody is going to know his uh, de deputy. As it's uh, if it's too big a parliament, uh, it's hopeless for them to work together. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, then it breaks up in groups and, and they, they have difficulties to cooperate. So I've uh, worked uh, for, s for not very long time, but for a certain time in the US Senate uh, and uh, with a senator. And I think those hundred people and I've seen it on the House of Representatives. In the Senate, it's much easier. With 100 people, you still can get the contact. You know each, you, each other. Uh, you can build uh, yeah, a solution over the party line. So it's, uh, I think that's perhaps, the, I wouldn't go much, much larger for a European Parliament. And have perhaps just one chamber makes it easier have a strong president, popular elected, it would, I would him also give him a veto power. <laughs> as long as you can remove him off from office <laughs> if he's gone crazy or whatever. Uh, but, and then, but really reduce then the duties of this uh, European Union uh, to the minimum and try to decentralize as much as possible. Then I think we might be able to, to to achieve something like the United States of Europe. Well, it sounds, therefore, that you, if you were a British citizen, would you vote to leave the European Union then? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I would welcome you in the European economic area. Yeah. That would be great, you know. We would become, of course, much more important, you know. Yeah. Now we are just there with... <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, Thank you. Norway and Island and so on. That would be quite <laughs> something. Um, yes, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, if we could go to the member with the watch. Yes, I appreciate. <laughs> so I appreciate there are a few, but the watch that's in the air is <laughs> that's all I can see. Hi. Yeah. Um, very interesting. I, with your ideal of uh, lots of small states competing for citizens in in the future, um, you say there'd be not much need for arms and having an army and that could be a saving. Wouldn't actually the opposite be true? If there were lots of small states competing for resources, there'd be great incentive to, to actually try and claim land and resources and therefore people and boost the resources of the state. Well, uh, of course, that's, that's a danger. Uh, I think uh, somehow you need an authority uh, which uh, prevents this uh, way. Um, for, for the Europeans, has been, there have been the Americans who looked after that, that we stop fighting each other. Uh, uh, perhaps the United Nations could play such a role with a kind of uh, peace force. Uh, then you could uh, get rid perhaps of all those armies, have a peace force uh, which has then to work only in a very sort of 
clear definition of what they do. Um, that I think would be a uh, perhaps way to, to solve it. Uh, I agree it's a little bit of utopia, but uh, we have been able to survive uh, without an army. My ancestors in the middle of the 19th century thought it was an unnecessary expense because uh, they had to pay it out of their own pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 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 it would not protect much. and. I think, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You, you need to really to defend yourself. I think also quite a large army. Thank you for the question. I think we're time for one final question, and we'll just come down right to the front here. Um, oh, wait, wait for the microphone. That's okay. Uh, thank you very much for addressing us tonight. I found it very interesting. Definitely something to think about in the future and discuss about as well. Um, I have one question regarding the role of the um, person or the monarch who has the veto power. So you said that in your uh, model of democracy, for example, if uh, enough people in the country uh, Gets vote, you know, signs together to put put it to a popular vote. They firstly consult the monarch, monarch or the p person who has the vo veto power uh, to sort of discuss whether this is something which is feasible and doesn't go against some of the laws that already exist. But you could also say that that role could also be fulfilled by the parliament which is in place. So my question is, um, what is the benefit of an the monarch with a veto power over just having a parliament uh, which can also make decisions? The <coughs> what we have seen uh, in parliaments, uh, they have to be voted in again. And uh, where often you basically, you to a certain degree, you have to buy those votes. Mm. Uh, that leads to a situation where most of the European states uh, and democracies are, uh, that they are up to there and to that. And it also comes to enlarge the bureaucracy to a certain degree because the party members want to have an employment, etc. And, and so, so there I, I see uh, uh, the, the advantage, and then you, you have in a, in a parliament, you have to, to get your, uh, that I've seen in the Senate, <laughs> but I've also seen it in Liechtenstein and in other countries. Now you want to get uh, your bill through, and then you have to go uh, for, uh, for enough votes. Um, and then uh, somebody says, yeah, I'm only going to vote for you if you vote, if you change this or that, or if you're going to vote afterwards for my uh, thing, which comes with the result that somebody said, I think it was it Churchill, uh, that, you know, so many things come in that the law becomes like a sausage. Don't look into it. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's <laughs> contradictory, difficult to understand, and so on. So there I think uh, it's, it can be a president uh, who has somehow the support of the people, but who tries to, to, to fix that, to say, no, okay, that's not going to work. You have to make it clearer. You have to, those special interests have to go out. Um, and uh, very often these special interests, they, they come in, you know, here and there and so on. And so, and, 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 and that makes the law complicated, it adds to the expenses. And so that I would say, as far as I've seen, is, is an advantage. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Well, that seems like a, a good place to end. Um, so thank you very much for everyone who asked questions. And thank you very much once again for coming. If you could all remain seated while guests leave the room, but please put your hands together for Prince Hans Adam II of Liechtenstein.